Hey guys, I'm here today to share my birth story for baby number two. Um, I never did one exactly like this for my first daughter. Um, I did do like a what I remember a year later video, so I'll link that in the corner. Um, baby number one was breech, and so she was a scheduled C-section. Um, for baby number two, I really wanted to have an unmedicated VBAC, and so this is that story. So I'm going to be glancing down at my phone every so often because I did write all of this out. It was about 3,000 words, and it is uh, posted on Reddit. So that version is very long, very detailed, and has a lot of like TMI stuff, which like if you're into that and you want to read something very long, I'm going to link that Reddit post down below if you want to see that. Um, otherwise, this one will be very slightly um, a bridge just to leave out some of the more gory details, probably, um, though I haven't scripted it, so who knows, I might get a little bit crazy. Um, so here we go, my second pregnancy with my daughter. Um, the age gap was 26 months, um, 26 and a half months. Um, so I had plenty of time to recover. She was about 18 months old before we got pregnant with my second daughter. So um, that's pretty good for, you know, C-section. You want to make sure that you're recovered and, you know, healed all properly. Um, the nurse wasn't able to even see my incision uh, postpartum with this one. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty healed from the first birth. Also, because it was a scheduled C-section for a breech presentation, it had nothing to do. Like I never went into labor, so I didn't know what labor was like. But also the C-section reason had nothing to do with like a failure to progress or a um, whatever they call it, where your pelvis is too big, too small for the baby's big head or anything like that, that would have a risk of recurring. Um, so as long as she wasn't, you know, this baby wasn't breech, um, then there was no reason to indicate that I wouldn't be a fantastic candidate for TOLAC, which is um, trial of labor after cesarean. That's what they call it in the hospital because they're generous enough to let you try to have your own baby. Um, <laughs> that, um, yeah, with the hospital policies, they, there was really no reason to, to not let me do my thing and have my vaginal birth. So they still, though, were not going to induce me from a dead stop. So if I hadn't gone into labor by 41 weeks, they were going to schedule a c-section um so that was nerve-wracking especially because 41 weeks was a monday there was no availability that day they don't schedule them on the weekends and so i ended up with my scheduled date on 40 plus 4 this is friday um and so that meant like in a lot of ways my body was like a first-time mom going to labor for the first time you tend to go late um, so I was worried <laughs> that I would end up going late and my body would have been perfectly fine having a baby at, you know, 40 plus five, say, but it was too late. They'd already cut the baby out because the hospital didn't want to wait. And so I was really uncomfortable about that whole thing um, and really nervous about just like trying to get myself to go into labor in time. I had Braxton Hicks from 36 and a half weeks on really consistently like not timeably, but very frequently. And they didn't hurt, but they were very frequent. I occasionally would try to time them and they would be like 10 minutes apart, but they, they wouldn't hurt, it would just be like pressure. Um, and so we were doing all the stuff, dates, um, walking, exercise generally, squats, yoga, ball, sex, um, spicy food, I, I guess. Um, a little bit. I've heard that that's like the least effective. And also I always knew that I was going to be one of those people that threw up during labor. Um, and so I knew that spicy food was just going to end up hurting one way or the other. Did I say I was going to keep this from getting TMI? I'm not. My second pregnancy was pretty textbook um, with like everything just seemed a little bit harder earlier on this time. I started showing sooner. I just started feeling bigger sooner. Um, and I got SPD sooner, which is symphysis pubis dysfunction, which is basically the front of your crotch just like doesn't want to align right. And so it kills to walk too much or to roll over in bed. I'm a side sleeper. Um, so by the end of it, I was like grunting and like waking up my husband 
as I was trying to roll over in bed because like my sci my sciatic nerve would go numb on one side after a couple of hours and I would have to flop over and it was an ordeal. Um, so keep that in mind. I had SPD that will be relevant later. Um, the other thing that came up was uh, around 38 and a half weeks ish. I started developing a pups rash, which is a lot of medical words that mean basically itchy rash caused by pregnancy and oh my gosh so it started out on my tummy and it was fine ish you know and you get used to it I guess and I was scratching at it before I realized what it was um went to a doctor's appointment she was like yeah that looks like pups um here's the cream I'll prescribe it for you then the very next day I realized that what I thought were bug bites on my wrists and ankles were actually a spreading pups rash all over up and down my legs and arms and so for about a week there I was in absolutely miserable pain constantly itchy hugging um, bags of ice sleeping with bags of ice Benadryl didn't touch it um, so I have this pine tar soap that I use that helped a little bit I had the triamcimolone um, the uh, corticos topical corticosteroid cream that would help a little bit um, one day I wore wet clothes all day that helped a little bit, but then I tried to sleep in them and that didn't work. Um, so just generally I was miserable and I was really concerned that I was going to be so miserable from this itching that I wasn't going to be able to go unmedicated, that it was going to distract me during labor to the point where I would need the epidural just to be able to relax. Um, so by the time I got to labor, I was at that point where I was like, you know, I wanted to do is this unmedicated. I probably won't have pups next time. I guess I can try next time. But this time I'm kind of resigned that I'm more likely to need the epidural than I thought I would be. Um, so that was sort of part in my mind going in. But step aside, uh, I was trying to, you know, do what I could to get the labor going. Um, all 39 weeks I was one centimeter and about 50% effaced. Um, and the doctor at that check was like really enthusiastic and optimistic about my chances of going into labor that week, but it didn't happen. Um, medical history wise, my mom had the first three of us four um, like on our due dates. So like I was two hours late, uh, but she went into labor with all of us on our due dates. So I knew that that was a good sign, right? Because apparently that the, when your mom went into labor for her pregnancies, when you were born versus your due date, and when your husband was born versus his due date, that I never found out. Um, but yeah, I was born, like I said, two hours after my due date, and my mom had that happen again two other times. My fourth, the, her fourth child, my youngest sister, uh, was 10 days late, which would have been too late. So I was hoping that that wouldn't be the case. But anyway, week 40 comes around my due date. I have an appointment. I'm still one centimeter dilated and 50% effaced. But the midwife was very helpful. She knew that I really wanted to be back. She knew I was a good candidate for it. She was super supportive there. Um, also very um, uh, sympathetic about the rash, which at this point was looking the worst it ever had. It's probably the worst that day. Um, just totally uh, everywhere. I, I don't want to show you pictures, but if you ask, I can maybe maybe share a link in the comments. Anyway, um, she was able to get in there really good and, in her words, sweep the heck out of my membranes. Um, so that caused um, like cramping right away and spotting right away. Um, and that lasted all morning. And then I took an afternoon nap when my toddler was napping and I woke up and felt fine. So I was like, eh, I hope this is, you know, so I just kept walking. My husband was home from work at this point, And so he was able to stay home with our daughter and I would take laps around the neighborhood, um, <laughs> risking my lungs in the process because there's been wildfires and there was, you know, it wasn't too bad in our area. Most of the smoke was really high up, but still not the best. Um, but so I was just doing walking. I was doing all of the things. Um, but Monday, my due date, nothing happened. That night, I was awoken a few times by some stronger contractions, like not the Braxton Hicks that were pressure, but actual painful ones that would wake me up. 
Uh, it happened maybe three or four times overnight. Um, then I started to sort of wake up around five, decided to start timing them. Um, and they were like five, one, one. And I was like, huh, these aren't very painful. They are definitely different from the Braxton Hicks, but I feel like, cause the one doctor had told me not just five, one, one, but five, one, one, five, meaning five minutes apart, one minute each for an hour at a five pain scale. Um, and these were like maybe a, a two or three. Um, and I was able to just sort of breathe through them without too much trouble. Um, and so I was like, something's just not ready. Like my body's not ready. I shouldn't, maybe shouldn't have been whatever, but I was checking myself. I was checking my own cervix like this whole week, every couple of days I would reach up there and see what was up. And so I knew that I hadn't had any dilation change. It was the same as it had been all week. Um, and so I was like, I'm just gonna keep, keep on, keep on, um, go to bed Tuesday night. Um, we had, we had, um, oh, that's, that's probably TMI what I had for dinner. So never mind that. But I did eat my very last, um, Klondike bar, which was my pregnancy cravings, mint chocolate chip Klondike bars. And I still miss them because you're not really supposed to eat mint when you're breastfeeding. It's supposed to be like bad for your production, which I don't think is a problem really, but also like, I'm not gonna, yeah. I'll save, I'll save it up for my Christmassy mochas. Anyway, um, went to bed Tuesday night, um, around 10 o'clock. I finally went to bed and I was at that point feeling kind of off and I couldn't put my finger on exactly what it was. Um, I think now looking back, the, the word I would use is I felt like I had chills. I checked my temperature, did not have a fever. I just kind of felt a little bit weird but I was like, I'll go to bed. I'll try to get some sleep. I had that day tried to nap and I was having contractions every 10 minutes at least. Um, and so I was able to sort of doze for 10 minutes at a time for about an hour. That was like all the sleep I got Tuesday from 5 a.m. on. 10 p.m. I lay down. I'm on my side because that's the way I sleep the best. And I start having stronger contractions like as soon as I've laid down they start hurting more than they did previously. They're maybe now a four, I don't know. Um, and they were still like every 10 minutes for about an hour. Um, and then just about at 11 o'clock, I get one really strong one and it's like a double peak one, one of those like back to back contractions. And I realized suddenly like, uh, I know what's wrong with me, I'm gonna throw up. Um, so I grab like the kitchen towels that had been wrapping my ice packs I throw up into that, but it didn't catch it all because it was a whole big dinner that we'd had. Um, and it went all over the bed and all over the floor underneath the bassinet. So that was suddenly my husband's job was trying to clean up the area where our new baby was going to be pretty, pretty quickly now at this point, because as soon as I threw up, I started contracting 311, um, really strong. It was like it kicked up a notch um, to the point where I was moaning through them instead of just breathing. Um, went out to the living room. I was sort of rocking on the yoga ball and that kind of helped a little bit uh, with my pain. And I think at that point I was already starting to feel some pressure in my hips um, that my husband was able to sort of provide some counter pressure for. But he was trying to clean up everything as quickly as possible because he knew like I was saying it's going to be tonight. We're going in tonight. Um, so I timed it for about an hour. He, I think told his parents two or three hours, but I was like, no, it's been an hour. They're three, one, one. I did try to check myself again. And I think at this point she had like, looking back, I think at this point she had dropped farther down into my birth canal. And that was why I couldn't reach. Um, I felt also, it felt maybe more squishy. Like I couldn't find the opening of my cervix. Um, partially because I think baby was lower and I was more faced, which I found out when I got to the hospital. Um, we went in and they, um, the restrictions they have for COVID are that my husband had to wait in the parking garage for like an hour and a half or so, um, while I got triaged. So I was in the little triage room by myself contracting for an hour, moaning through contractions and me hooked up to the monitors. Um, and I don't even remember what I was doing. I know I had my phone because I had called my husband to tell him, you know, an update at some point, but I don't remember if I was like 
playing solitaire on my phone or if I was just zoning out. Um, anyway, they told me when they checked me that I was like a stretchy two, two and a half ish that I was, I think, I think that first nurse said a hundred percent of face, but later I got a 90. So we'll say 90, but that baby was at plus one station. So that's like almost halfway. Um, and I'm pretty sure that that was what changed, that when I laid down on my side with my pillow between my legs to go to sleep, something about that position caused her to go farther down. And so that's what started causing the stronger contractions, the, um, the pressure in my hips, and things to really kick off. So um, because I was only at a two, she said she would have discharged me and sent me home for a while except that on the monitor she was seeing baby's heart decelerate with some of the contractions and they were also seeing some tachycardia which i guess is a high heart rate um so because they wanted to monitor that they wanted to admit me so i had to have constant monitoring they said it was because of my history of c-section but as i've mentioned like my history of c-section really had nothing to do with baby doing well through labor at all so it wasn't so much that as it really was just like for their peace of mind for watching her heart rate, which I was honestly fine with. They put me on the wireless for a while and that worked well when it worked. Um, and I found it really helpful because I, like, I like the data, you know, you can tell I've already been talking about how I've been checking my own cervix and stuff and all these numbers. Um, I like the numbers and I like knowing where we are. And I found it helpful for my husband to be able to watch the monitors during the contraction, to be able to know where I was without me having to like, tell him everything that he was able to sort of intuit a little bit more um so we labored for several hours um in that room we were sitting on the yoga ball and he was doing counter pressure on my hips he was massaging like my my buttocks area my lower back um and that was helping because like i said there was a lot of pressure down low um she was pretty low throughout so we checked into the hospital at two at two two and a half centimeters um, and then labored till seven. My next check at seven a.m. I was four and a half centimeters. Um, and at that point, the midwife was um, she was about to, I think, leave. Maybe at eight she left. Anyway, but she was saying like that your your contractions are slowing down. Um, we can offer you some pitocin to augment at this point. And I, who had been just sort of sitting on a yoga ball and napping between contractions, realized that like that seemed really premature to me um, because things were coming faster when I was upright and walking and stuff anyway. So I'm like, no, let me just get up and do some walking around. I was just sort of shuffling back and forth trying to stay on my feet. I was so tired, but at the time I wasn't even able to articulate that that's what it was. Like I was able to articulate that I was more comfortable able to doze between contractions, but I wasn't even like thinking about the fact that I had been awake since 5 a.m. the morning before. At this point, 26 hours with no more than a couple of minutes of dozing between contractions. Like basically all of Tuesday, I know now, now no, I was in prodromal labor um, and it sucks because you really can't sleep through that. Um, my body was just like, all right, let's get this going. Like, don't fall asleep, Rebecca, you're going to have a baby. It's like, yeah, but not for another day and a half. Um, anyway, so we got up, we did a little bit more walking that helped to get things, you know, going a little bit faster. Uh, let's see. So three hours later, 10 AM, I was at six centimeters, still 90% effaced. Baby had lowered down to zero station. So that's like halfway. Um, and around that time I was realizing that like every single contraction, I felt like my body was trying to poop. Um, and I had already tried going to the bathroom, um, and there was nothing there, <laughs> but my body, this entire, entire labor process was convinced that there was at least a little tiny bit of poop there that wanted to come out because I was involuntarily pushing down, um, with every single contraction. There was nothing I could do about it, but this is going to be very relevant later. Oh, so the good news though is from Tuesday, on Tuesday, my rash felt manageable. I still could feel it if I was paying attention to it, but it wasn't distracting me. Um, Wednesday, while I was in the hospital, it did not bother me at all, which is an amazing blessing because 
I don't know if I could have, like I said, I don't know if I could have gone unmedicated if I had been distracted by this rash the whole time. Every single person on staff in L&D knew what it was the second they saw, even my arms, but definitely, you know, my, my belly was very characteristic of pups. My arms and legs were all covered in hives as well. Um, they all knew exactly what it was and they had so many questions because I didn't fit any of the, um, the risk factors. Like you're more likely to get pups if it's your first pregnancy, if you're having multiples or if you're having a boy or boys and none of those second pregnancy, singleton girl. Um, both of them were girls. So like no reason, but I'm just hopeful that the thing that holds true is that you generally don't get it again. Um, because it's pretty miserable. 1 p.m. We've been at this for 11 hours in the hospital. I'm at seven centimeters. That's good news, right? Like it's slow, but it's making progress. Um, they decide to break my water. I'm officially, I guess, 100% faced at this point. Um, every time I was given one of these like interventions of augmentations and stuff, like breaking my water, I figure, okay, great. Cause I was already sort of napping in bed. I'm like, great, you break my water. Maybe that'll do some of the work and I don't have to get out of bed and I'll just lay here and let it do its thing. And that didn't really happen. Um, next time I know that if I'm exhausted, I might just offer the epidural in order to get some sleep. Um, but in any case, I got to force myself to be up and about more because laying on my back is not helpful. Laying on my side was helpful. But again, SPD is an SOB and oh my gosh, it hurt. So at some point they had me up on my side with one leg in the stirrup. And so I was kind of not, I wasn't straight up and down aligned in a way to support my weight. So it did start to hurt after a while, but that really did work very well um, on either side. So. I, I like laying on my side generally. If I didn't have the SPD, it would have been fantastic. I would have just laid like that all day. Anyway, she broke my water at seven centimeters. Um, an hour and a half later, I was at eight. So that's not bad, right? But the problem was that at eight centimeters, the nurse checked me. This was the nurse that we had most of the day on Wednesday. And she was the weak link in my care team. She was fine, but she wasn't great. And she was... Um, just like never seemed to be really interested in like making sure that we understood what she was saying. <laughs> um, she had an accent. She was wearing a mask. That doesn't help. Um, but what we gathered from her when she did the check was your cervix is at an eight. Your cervix is swollen because you're pushing. You need to stop pushing and start doing this. He, he, who, this is the way she did it. It's wrong. Um, and you know, panting and not pushing. Um, and so basically then I start freaking out, um, because swollen cervix doesn't sound like the sort of thing that can resolve in the time it takes to dilate to a 10. You know, I know that eight, I'm in transition now. So it's gonna, they say from eight to 10 goes really fast, right? Notice this is 2.30 PM and I get to eight. Um, yeah, so we start doing this panting. I start immediately hyperventilating, um, we have to look up a YouTube tutorial on how to do properly pant during labor. Turns out the hee hee is the intake, not breathing super fast. Um, so that helped. I was able to get the, the hyperventilation under control. Thank goodness. Cause baby needs oxygen. Um, but I was basically fighting every single contraction for hours. Um, because I was so freaked out about this swollen cervix thing because I knew that if I couldn't get this under control, um, that we were going to be looking at an emergency C-section, you know, you can't just deliver through a swollen cervix. And, um, and so, yeah, that was the worst, the hardest thing, the hardest part of this was trying to fight transition for hours. Um, and honestly, I think that if she had maybe been more explicit, phrase things better, that I would have been able to relax better and it would have maybe would have been born in the afternoon. Um, because yeah, it was it was really tough to try to fight what my body was doing because as I mentioned before, I felt this pressure in my bottom that like every single contraction, as I would breathe in through my nose, right, my body would start to push. Um, 
against that pressure in my in my rectum and that was there's nothing I could do about it but I was trying to I was trying to sort of curl in and pull my pelvic floor up with each contraction I ended up with really sore arms I'm trying to like pull against the bed to try to fight against it I was basically fighting everything that my body was telling me to do um, for hours I don't even know what time it was. I basically it was it was hours, and they checked me again. I was still at an eight, but this is around. Finally, the, the midwife checked me the next time. She said I was still at an eight, but we wanted to get more clarification about what's going on. Am I doing this right? You know, because it didn't feel helpful. Obviously, I wasn't making any progress. Um, and it was hell trying to fight whatever was happening. Like. And so we talked to the midwife and said, look, the, the nurse said that she has a swollen cervix. Are we doing, are we breathing correctly? Can you wait with us through a contraction to see if I'm handling this properly? She checks again. She goes, yeah, I don't feel any swelling. And so this whole fear of like, okay, well, at least that's good. Is there a risk of that? Like what's going on? She's, so she told me no swelling, continue to pant because you don't want to be pushing um, because you're not complete yet, but, um, that like, don't stress about what your body is doing. You know, if your body is trying to push a little bit, like that's apparently what it's trying to do. At least I was able to take the don't stress part to heart. And so over the course of the next hour or two, I finally got to nine. Um, it, it really did take a load off knowing that it wasn't like an imminent threat of like, well, we got to get the swelling down you know, before baby can come out, it was just like a, just a caution, just pant through them instead of deep breathing through them. Um, cause mostly what got me through the majority of labor was four counts in through your nose and four counts out through your mouth. And I was trying to visualize breathing into my diaphragm and breathing out into my cervix. That helped. I don't know if that works for you. There's your tip. Um, and having my husband there, he was an amazing coach. Um, he was doing a really good job of like keeping me on that, not letting me hyperventilate because I do have a history of like being prone to that, I guess. Um, you know, helping me breathe slowly, helping me, you know, keep time. He was just doing so good. Um, he was, he was such a help that and the, the massage and counter pressure and stuff on my lower back that was helping against the pressure there. Um, he was amazing. So I get to a nine, um, they come in and they're talking to me about how long it's taking. At this point, I think it's got to be at least 6, maybe 6.30. Um, they say, you know, it's just been such a long time. You've got to be exhausted. We want to give you a low dose of Pitocin to just get you over the finish line. Get you that last centimeter dilated so that you don't, like, give out before. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's always the concern of, like, the cascading interventions. But I... You know, they, they're like, it's just a little bit. If it's too much, we can stop. Um, you know, and we're not going to... I was concerned that I would need an epidural from the... You know, because you hear these horror stories about Pitocin contractions. Um, but I agreed. We did. We started um, a two on Pitocin. I don't know what that means. Um, two of what. But the drip was only on for like 10, 15 minutes on the Pitocin. I honestly didn't even notice a difference. They may have been a little bit stronger, but like I was in transition. So what's, you know, an eight instead of a nine or a seven or like whatever. Um, none of the contractions ever felt unbearable. Like I never felt them so much as pain. I felt a lot of pressure, um, but I was just was focusing on just get through this one. You know, just get through this contraction. That's all you have to worry about is this one contraction. And that worked for me. Um, I was able to focus on my breathing, counter pressure on my hips, and just one at a time. And I was able to do it. I think some people are luckier than others when it comes to actual, like, labor pain. Um, for me, it was a lot of, yeah, I mean, it was painful, but it was, yeah, I was able to handle it. I don't know. Um, but yeah, the Pitosa was on for like 10 or 15 minutes. And then things start going crazy. Um, because remember the baby's heart has been a little bit unstable this entire time and the Pitocin did not agree with her. Um, so she started decelerating during contractions. Again, I heard the word arrhythmia thrown around a couple times. I don't know if that was related to the contractions or if it was a 
anyway, it was a concern. Um, I have a family history of arrhythmia on my dad's side, so like, there, there was something that I knew was like a, a legitimate could be an issue. Um, and anyway, so yeah, she starts decelerating. They, everybody comes rushing in. There's like half a dozen people in the room. Um, and they're rolling me from side to side because I had been on my back. I, again, I was like, maybe the Pitocin will do the work instead of me. I'm just going to nap. Um, <laughs> so I was laying on my back again. They come and they roll me over on my side. Remember, I have SPD. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they roll me over to my side. I'm like, okay, great. Can I get something between my legs? And they're like, yeah, we can grab you some pillows or let me go get a peanut ball. But you got to really roll over on your side because baby's heart rate. They say baby's heart rate. Of course, I do whatever they tell me. Um, and so I'm rolling over my side, I'm rolling over my other side, there, um, I've been on, like, the, the external monitors by this point have given out, um, and they've been replaced with the strap-on ones. So I'm not tied to being in bed, I was able to labor on the yoga ball next to the bed with those on, and that was fine, more or less, as long as I wasn't leaning over too much. Um, anyway, so I had them strapped on, they weren't, they were getting inconsistent, you know, utility, I guess. So they were moving those around. Um, they decided they wanted to do internal monitoring. So they put in first the contraction monitor, which goes between baby and the inside. It's like inside your uterus, between the wall of the uterus and the baby. Um, and I guess it's more accurate because it gives you intensity as well as frequency. Um, I don't know. This is all data for my husband to use as he's coaching me, honestly. Um, and then they also, at some point, did put the um, extra, the internal monitor on baby's scalp, the little probe. She's got just like a tiny little scab there from where it goes, just goes under the skin of the scalp. Um, weirdly enough, I could feel that twitching constantly, and I don't know if that was her moving or if it was the monitor moving. Maybe it's just really inflexible. Um, but that was kind of weird and distracting, but not painful or a problem at all. Anyway. Um, they at one point had the external monitor, the internal monitor, and an ultrasound wand all at the same time, all getting three different readings. They're having a really hard time pinpointing baby's heart rate at all, but they're seeing D cells down to the 50s, which is a terrifying number for a baby's heart rate. Um, but at the same time, the OB had to, you know, shout at somebody twice to get me a pulse ox so they could compare it to my heart rate to make sure to eliminate that. Um, cause there's a chance that maybe they're getting my heart rate instead of the baby's. Um, so there was a lot of confusion as well as genuine concern because they were getting readings that were not good. Um, and so they start, of course, talking worst case scenarios saying, you know, if this doesn't get resolved, if we can't figure out a way to make baby's heart happy, then you know, there's always the worst case scenario of an emergency C-section. And I've been working so hard to avoid that all day long um, that obviously I don't want that, but also obviously you say baby's heart rate and I do what you tell me to do. Um, so they are suggesting to get an epidural as a precautionary measure in case I need an emergency surgery so that they wouldn't have to, you know, put me under general. I'd like to be there for my baby's birth, you know, and also... I think I'm finally really in the transition transition that, you know, sort of mind space where you're like, I can't do this anymore. Um, and I think as soon as I agreed to that epidural, I reached that point of like, just get it to me. Like, as soon as I agree to it, I want to have it, please. But they told me um, that they first have to bolus some fluid for about 20 minutes. So they put me on another drip of, um, of saline. I think I have two going at this point. My swelling finally went down yesterday on like, she's nine, she was nine days old yesterday. I think my swelling in my feet is finally gone because this entire time I did throw up at some point in the hospital as well. Like I always knew I was going to be one of those people that throws up during labor. Um, and so I've been afraid to eat too much because I ate a granola bar and it came back up. So I've mostly just been eating ice chips, drinking sips of juice, sips of water. I'm dehydrated. Um, so they've been having me on IV fluids. Um, Anyway, they, they say it's going to take about 20 minutes for this fluid, the, you know, to get all the way dripped into your IV. Um, and then, then we'll call the anesthesiologist after 20 minutes and she'll be here, you know, immediately. So I'm like, okay, great. 
I just have to get through 20 minutes and then I'll have some pain relief and I'll be able to just, you know, finish this off, like whatever. Um, and so I'm laying there on one side, just sort of miserable feeling uh, it, in hindsight, the most transition that I did where I was just like, how long has it been? How much more is there? And my husband was looking at the bag. He's like, it's about halfway. Um, I was like, okay, all right, I can do this for 10 more minutes. It felt like an eternity. Um, they then at some point had to flip me back over into my right side. They, they checked me between flipping from my left to my right, said I was at nine and a half. There was a lip on the left side. So they put me on my right side. I guess they know that that helps. They're the experts. So, um, but that also, I think must have helped with baby's heart rate because for the first time in like an hour, um, my husband and I, I think we're alone in the room together for the first time. And, um, after maybe probably like two contractions on that right side and like the IV is almost done, um, uh, maybe two contractions on my right side, I realize wonder of wonders, because like I've been mentioning, I have felt the need to poop with every single contraction all day freaking long. Um, and I realize as I'm laying there on my right side, my husband's doing his best to hold my hand around my back. I'm actually pooping. Like this is like, I'm pretty sure I'm legitimately pooping right now. I ask him to check. He's like, yep, he cleans me up. And then I'm realizing, first of all, complete vindication. I knew there was a poop there all along. My body wasn't lying to me. It was. But anyway, um, so that felt good, <laughs> but it didn't relieve the pressure um, because I realized that it was more than just an urge to poop. It was like a force that was happening. And I um, got the closest I ever got to not being able to talk through contraction at all. As I gasp out to my husband, call. <laughs> I'm trying to tell him, like, in my brain, the, sent the complete sentence is, call the midwife, my body's trying to push. And all I got out was, like, call and, like, push. <laughs> like, I think it was, like, in the middle of one of those double peak, really strong contractions. And um, he, he got the message. <laughs> and I think I was able to articulate it, like, in the, the brief gap between contractions, but he calls the midwives, they come in, I say, I think I'm, I think it's happening. So they're like, they get me on my back, they check me, they say, yep, there's baby's head, let's do this. And I'm like, there's like a couple drops left in that IV. We got so close to having that epidural and didn't need it. I am a pro, so I felt pretty, pretty proud of that. In hindsight, looking back, like they were always gonna check me before they had the anesthesiologist place anything. Um, and if I was that close, I probably would have been like, okay, let's just give it like five more contractions and it would have been probably done by then. Um, but it was, yeah, it felt pretty good to just that narrowly avoid the epidural because yeah, I felt like an absolute beast. Um, so yeah, they say we're complete. Baby's head is ready to go. Um, and so they get me in the, as far as I understand it from all of my research, 100% worst possible positions to push, right? Where I'm laying on my back, they've got feet in stirrups, holding my knees, um, holding my breath, pushing with my, like, my rectal muscles instead of my PC muscles, um, and pushing at all. You know, I, I've heard that the best way is to sort of labor down and let your body do things naturally and to not really strain, to breathe through the pushing so as not to tear. Um, but again, they say baby's heart rate and I do what you tell me. So, <laughs> and it, the thing is it was working. So I was like, okay, they're telling me I'm doing a good job. I'm just going to just keep doing what they're saying to do. Let's do this the way that they, the professionals are telling me is working. And so let's do it. So I was laying there, I was pushing on my back. It was probably about 20 minutes from calling the nurses in to baby being born. Um, and there were maybe four or five contractions that I was actively pushing through those you know, like three counts of 10 that had geno counting for me. Um, and there was like a, they had me rest for like one or two in between a couple of them. Um, and that was crazy because yeah, my body was pushing, especially on the inhale, um, like it had been, but stronger. Um, because I guess there was now something that was actually going to give, you know, it wasn't just like a phantom poop. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, uh, pushed for, for a little while and then get to the point where one really good contractions worth of pushing, um, we, oh, they, they brought in a mirror. So I was able to see a little bit, which was um, really cool. Um, I, I closed my eyes for a little bit because I didn't really want to watch it all, but being able to see the progress and being able to, to watch it actually working is really motivating. Um, so that was cool. She has a lot of hair. Um, I thought she was going to wake up at some point so that I would be like showing her off, but um, sorry. <laughs> she's actually napping fantastically right now. Um, yeah, she uh, she's coming. She's basically crowning. Like I, I feel that I'm pretty sure the closest thing to the ring of fire, I feel, they, they, at the end of a contraction, they're like, okay, now rest through the next one. Just breathe through the next one. So the, oh, so the whole time I'm pushing, the midwife is like doing some sort of perineal massage, I think, partially to sort of indicate to me physically by touch, like push in this direction, like downward um, towards my rectum. Um, but also I think to try to stretch things out a little bit and to prevent some tearing. And I think that was also the reason that she had me pause there and wait as she's crowning. Um, it felt so weird because you know it's like right there why do you want to stop right at the point where it's the biggest um but i think it was to sort of slowly let the baby out slowly stretch but also babies who are born too quickly end up with a lot of fluid in their lungs so you do want to push a little bit slowly um so that was yeah i had to you know wait through a contraction i don't remember if it was one or two but i was just doing the deep breathing the four count in and four count out and on the breath in is when my body would sort of push um and so it was either on that first or second contraction of waiting while crowning that um my body just pushed her head the rest of the way out on its own um and she started crying immediately the second her head was out which was such a blessing because uh, like my first daughter with the C-section didn't start crying right away and I couldn't even see her. So that was scary. Um, you know, I know that that's pretty common that, you know, she takes a little bit of rubbing before she starts crying, but it was just a great blessing to be able to hear her cry immediately. She wasn't even all the way out. Um, and so that was good. And then I, I was done pushing, like I was still up in the stirrups and the midwife just sort of maneuvered one arm out. Um, and the rest of her body just sort of slid into her hands. Um, they got her up onto me, so the pediatric nurse started toweling her down. Um, there was the delayed cord clamp clamping is the standard now. So it was, a you know, at least 30 seconds to a minute um, of, uh, of waiting for the cord to clear out. And she, I couldn't see her because she was attached to the cord and her face was away from me. But I was just like, so euphoric. Like, I still keep reliving that moment of her coming out. It's just incredible. Um, like, what my body was capable of doing and just the fact that I was able to do it without medication and all of that. I just feel, feel really proud of myself. Um, but just sort of in awe of what my body was able to do. So yeah, they, they um, had my husband cut the cord um, and then they took baby over to the warmer to check her out and listen to her heart and stuff. And um, as soon as she was her side, as soon as she was out, whatever the heart issues were, were completely resolved. There was no rhythmia, no deceleration. She's been doing great. Um, and so that is a load off. It was all just caused by the labor. Sorry, baby. Um, I guess that's my fault and she's doing great so that was good because at some point in the process of them getting everything situated and with all of the heart rate issues um the, the word NICU I heard the word NICU they were asking for a NICU nurse to come and be present at the warmer to, to help check her out and also just as a precaution but I'm laying there with my feet up in stirrups going oh my gosh if she has to go to the NICU like, I can't just send Gino to go with her because they're only allowing one visitor at a time and that's gonna, we're not gonna be able to breastfeed right away and what are we gonna do about that? But then like, if he doesn't go with her, she's gonna be alone and... <laughs> so I started spiraling that way and going, nope, just don't worry about it. It's just a precaution, it's fine. Um, so anyway, she was checked out, she was fine. She was weighed in Apgard and got her little bow hat and then came back. Um, laid on you to do some skin to skin while I was getting stitched up. We couldn't really nurse 
well because I was flat on my back until she was done taking care of my area down below. Um, there are more details about what happened down there in the Reddit post. I thought it was funny and interesting, sort of. So check that out in the link below if you're interested. But I, that's the TMI part at least that I will um, cut out of this recounting. Um, we were able to do some skin to skin until I was able to sit up and then I nursed on one side and then she did skin to skin with Gino while I ate a turkey sandwich. He was like, here's a sandwich. I said, what kind of sandwich? He said, turkey. And I said, okay, great. Does it have onions? And he goes, it does not have onions. He, my husband, they, they brought me out a sandwich. They have a stash of you haven't eaten all day sandwiches in labor and delivery. The point is, I got most of the way through this sandwich before realizing that it was literally just two slices of wheat bread with some cold cut turkey in between, and that somewhere in the box was a packet of mayonnaise and a packet of mustard, but I just ate the whole thing plain because <laughs> I was so hungry. And it was just crazy because you know how usually you have a stomach bug and you recover slowly? Well, it was like I had had a stomach bug all day because I couldn't keep anything down, but the instant the baby was out, I was ravenous and knew, you know, Psych uh, mentally, like, um, as a fact, not as in my feelings, but in facts, I still have baby brain, uh, that it was going to be okay. I wasn't going to throw it up because I was fine. So that was weird. But uh, it was the most delicious, boring sandwich I've ever had. And we got our, um, you know, golden hour. So, yeah, uh, like I said, I transition started at 2.30. Yeah, baby was born at 7.57 uh, p.m. That was crazy. Um, yeah, I guess my advice to any of you is if your nurse mentions cervical swelling, get really clear from her what she means before you start fighting your body for hours and hours um, because that was ridiculous. But I'm just really glad that we were able to avoid cascading interventions. It could have gone much worse, I think, if, um, you know, just timing and providence hadn't been on our side. We had so many people praying for us and I'm so grateful for all of them. Um, that I know that that made a difference as well. Um, really grateful to everybody on our care team, especially the midwife um, who ended up catching the baby. It was sort of like during shift change. Um, so the midwife that had been with us all day um, had to go and she, she considered, I remember she almost didn't leave right away. She wanted to hang around and watch, um, and, you know, see me through. But then the, the new midwife was like, you know, first time labor, she could be pushing for hours. And, uh, yeah, I was actually out before 8 PM. So, um, she probably could have stayed if she'd wanted to, but I was very grateful to everybody we had and, um, really just, man, grateful for overall an amazing positive birth story. Um, it was, it was, quite a ride and I hope that that was sort of interesting to you guys I didn't get any footage of anything I think my husband might have some very uh, embarrassing footage that I don't want to share because um, he wanted to try to catch some stuff on camera but not a lot and yeah I didn't do any I didn't even try or want to try to vlog this because that's just not the kind of channel I am but I do want to sh I did want to share the story with you because I guess that's the kind of channel I am so if you like that subscribe because I have a newborn so if you want to see her sometimes um, I will be doing more baby related content coming up um, once this rash finally resolves itself I am going to be doing a full video on pups as well to share that entire experience but I want to give a full accounting of the timeline and while I'm still itching I cannot do that um, but generally that is all I've got to say ring the bell like and share and comment and I'll see you in the next video on Thursday, which is, again, another planner video. Bye.